Really, really happy to see all of you. I'm Barry Edelstein, Erna Fincy Viterbi, Artistic Director of the Old Globe. Happy to welcome you to the uh, Vicki and Carl Zeiger Insight Seminar for the wonderful new production at the Globe, Destiny of Desire, which opens Friday night. Thank all of you for being with us this evening. The Globe believes that theater matters. And our commitment is to make it matter to more people. And we do that not only with the shows that we produce here on our three stages in Balboa Park, but in all the arts engagement activity that we do in communities around San Diego. And one of the other ways that we make theater matter is by throwing, over, throwing the curtain open and opening up the doors and taking down the scenery so our audiences can get a glimpse of the process through which we make our work. And that's what this program is all about. And we have two incredibly special guests, the playwright and director of Destiny of, of Desire, who are going to share with you some of their insights about the work that they've done on this extraordinary show, what it is, where it came from, what we're doing here at the Old Globe. It's an extraordinary production, really unique, really interesting. And we have two giant artists with us. And I'm going to introduce them, the playwright Karen Zacharias is known to Globe audiences from her play called Native Gardens, which was produced in the Sherilyn Harvey White Theater a couple of years ago. Wonderful. She's working on a stage adaptation of Shane, believe it or not, uh, and has two upcoming Broadway-bound musicals, a studio film, and more. Karen is also under commission from the Old Globe and is working on a new adaptation of Edith Wharton's novel, The Age of Innocence, which we're looking forward to bringing to the Globe stage in a season soon. Her plays have been produced all over the United States at places like the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, Arena Stage, the Goodman Theater in Chicago, the Denver Center, Alliance Theater, pretty much every Every major theater in the country has had her work on their stages. I believe a couple of years ago, Karen was the most produced playwright in the United States. I think that's true, according to American Theater Magazine. Top 10, OK. Well, anyway. She's won a ton of awards, the New Voices Award, the 2010 Steinberg Citation for Best New Play, uh, and uh, a, a wide range of awards, including Washington, D.C.'s prestigious Helen Hayes Award for Outstanding New Play. She's the first playwright in residence at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., has taught playwriting at Georgetown University, and Karen is the founder of Young Playwrights Theater, an award-winning theater company that teaches playwriting in local public schools in the Washington, D.C. area. Karen is fluent in English and Spanish, and intimidatingly, she is highly proficient also in Danish and French, my goodness. Uh, born in Mexico, she lives in our nation's capital. Please welcome Karen Zacarias. Which one do you want? You want this one? one? You're the you're director. Well, I know, I'm the director. Oh, it's too much pressure here. How about, how about we do that? Is that all right? Which one? Which one? You take that one. OK. All right, and an old friend of the Old Globe, the Tony Drama Desk and Obie Award winner Ruben Santiago Hudson was last seen here with his absolutely breathtaking production of August Wilson's Jitney, which was the last play on the Old Globe stage before the pandemic hit in 2020. Um, of course, we know that production won the Tony Award for Best, uh, Best Broadway Revival and won several other awards, including the Drama Desk Award, the Outer Critics Circle Award, the Drama League Award, a long, long, long list of, uh, of awards, including six Tony nominations. Mr. Santiago Hudson is a Tony Award winner himself as featured actor for his performance in August Wilson's Seven Guitars, later went on to direct that play, and he's directed a whole bunch of plays, including many by August Wilson, some by Shakespeare, an extraordinary range of major, major works at stages all over the United States. He made his Broadway acting debut alongside Gregory Hines in Jelly's Last Jam, and has been on Broadway in his own play, Lackawanna Blues, Stick Fly, and Gem of the Ocean. He also recently recently adapted August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom for producer Denzel Washington and Netflix. Ruben wrote, executive produced, and co-starred in the HBO film Lackawanna Blues based on his Obie award-winning play, and that movie won all kinds of honors, including Emmy's Golden Globe, NAACP Image Award, and uh, on and on and on. Ruben's been seen in over three dozen movies now, and in a career that spans over four decades, he considers the opening of the Ruben Santi Santiago Hudson Fine Arts Learning Center in his hometown of Lackawanna, New York, as one of his proudest and most cherished accomplishments. Ruben Santiago Hudson. All right, Ruben. 
Okay, you two. So, big rehearsal day this afternoon. How's it going? It's terrible. It's just a mess now. It's great. <laughs> it's, you're in for a treat. You're in for a treat. It's really wonderful and extraordinary cast. The designers are world class. All uh, We have how many Tony Award winning designers there, well, whatever that means. But they're a very distinguished group and um, a uh, very uh, warm family of, of uh, artists. You're going to be a uh, very pleased, I think. And I'm going to ask you a little later to tell us about um, some of them, Ruben. But Karen, let me start by asking you this. Um, yes. you, call, you call the play Destiny of Desire an unapologetic telenovela for the stage. Yes. So just give us a little what's a telenovela, would you, for a second? OK, so uh, a telenovela is not the same as an American soap opera, because telenovelas are more like dynasty or Dallas, they are stories that, um, melodramas, that have a beginning, middle, and end. So when I moved to the United States and I started watching a soap opera, I was like, oh my god, this soap opera's been up for 30 years. <laughs> and, and, and no matter what day I turned in, there was a lady crying over coffee, and it was slow moving. <laughs> Versus the ones I saw in Latin America, if you miss two days, you're like, who's married to who? What? <laughs> so what happened? So th it, there's a different kind of show. They're, and they're played on primetime TV um, in the evening. And you know, at the end of a telenovela, the whole, a whole country can shut down because everybody's home to watch it. It's kind of the way people feel about succession right now. It's that. And, and they've been used a lot by the government and, and other entities to talk about social, uh, social problems, et cetera. So they're, they're a form of populist entertainment that is very big and now all over the globe with K-drama and you know all of that. I invented in Mexico? Did they originate in Mexico? No. They, well, they came from radio drama. So oh. invented is like, where did they start? Venezuela. Mexico became probably the first country that really started doing them. But Venezuela, Colombia, and then they get done in other countries, Brazil. Brazil, Brazil has a great telenovela um, history and uh, culture around that. So you know, during um, the Olympics, the uh, they couldn't cancel the telenovela. People did not want to watch the Olympics <laughs> as opposed to the telenovela. So they had to keep both going. Wow. Uh, so it's it's a very big phenomenon. So there's. This a statistic in the play, and I, I will talk about what that's doing in the play a little bit later, but the BBC said two billion people worldwide watch these? Yeah. I mean, that's just a crazy yeah, number Yeah, well, of India people. has them. I mean, they're, 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 the Korea is very famous for their K-drama. So yeah, it's a form of entertainment that really, really uh, pulls people in, and people get very engaged with the lives of these people on, on screen. And it's a, it's a form of, of a cultural Reunion. It does what theater does for a lot of small, you know, small communities and households, and it, that's what people talk about. And you were born in Mexico. Did you grow yes. up watching them? Uh, yes, I, I did. When my mom, like sometimes, my, especially when my parents were uh, out, so my <laughs> sister and I would do it, and we played telenovela. Like my sister and I would be like opening a door and slapping each other and doing, <laughs> doing that type of thing. It was a common kind of genre to play on the playground. Because it's melodramatic and it's, extremely expressive. Yes, and, and right. super fun. Right, right. Uh, Ruben, what about you? Did you have any relationship to this form? You didn't grow up in Mexico, but you do have a Latinx heritage. Did you, did you yes, have any uh, contact I was, with it? I, I was on soap operas for years. Yes. Right. I was Billy Cooper on Another World for three years. <laughs> Uh, I was on All My Children, One Life to Live, Ryan's Hope. In New York, before television was big, uh, we, before New York actors had access to television, we all did soap opera. So all my camera training is from soap operas. You know, it's like you, you get to a script, like three weeks later, you, you're in the same hospital bed with a guy that was dying in an hour. <laughs> you know, so he'll be dead in an hour. You know, three weeks later, you still walking in, in the room, you know, saying, you know, how you feeling today, you know. But so now I had a lot of relationships with, with uh, soap operas, which is American version of telenovelas. You know, telenovelas, we just, uh, we take it, a, take it to another height. Right. You know. So, uh, Karen, you had this idea to write this play, mm -hmm. right? So can you take us a little bit back to the origin of that? Yes. So um, one of the groups that I've started is called the Latinx Theater Commons, and we're a, a national group of of theater makers that with Latino roots that wanted to connect because we were very isolated. And we had a big meeting in Boston. And one of the things that kept coming up is the frustration actors and playwrights had when critics or people described the work, their work, their plays as 
telenovela because it was always said kind of disparagingly. And, um, and, and, and I would look at these plays, plays by Chiara Udes, you know, and saying, that's not a telenovela. And suddenly I was like, you know what? I'm going to write the best damn telenovela. So no one ever compares all the other stuff with it. And how do we look and create a telenovela? How, how can we do a, a year's worth of telenovela on stage in two hours? And it not be a farce, that it, do, that it does what it does to the people who are watching it. That in the beginning, you're like, oh, this is ridiculous. And then like later, you're like, oh my god, I hope she survives whatever's <laughs> happening there. So what, what is it about that draw that pulls in? And so I found a frame, which is the Brechtian frame to put around it, which is you know the idea that um, epic theater is there to change the world and to always constantly be reminding you as you're being entertained that there's something you can do about what's happening on stage. And I want to come back to choice. that a, yeah. a little bit later. Now, the play was produced um, to acclaim at regional theaters around the country, mm -hmm. right? There was a whole round of, uh, I don't know, four or five mm -hmm. different regional theaters. Um, but Ruben, it, that was a different production. Absolutely. This is this is a totally different production. So when did you get involved? Nell Nugent, uh, the Broadway producer. Let's talk about Nell for a second. <laughs> okay, sidebar. We, Hang on, Ruben, I'm going to come right back to you. So the Old Globe, as all of you know, has a big part of its life involved in originating productions that then go on to a subsequent life on, on Broadway or elsewhere around the country. Um, you know, Bob Fosse's Dancing and Almost Famous just enjoyed two brief, alas, runs on Broadway, but started here and, and, and then went there. So we have a constant communication with producers on Broadway Way, and this time with somebody who's an absolute legend named Nell Nugent. Ruben, can you tell us a little bit about her? Well, N Nell is, you got to go way back. I mean, <laughs> Nell, Nell produced, you know, was one of the producers on Amadeus, Nicholas Nickleby, M. Butterfly, Stick Fly. I mean, she's historic, you know, with, with the work she's done. But anyway, you know, I've always had a lot of respect for Nell. She produced a play that I was in on Broadway called Stick Fly. And um, she kept saying, I got to find a play for you. Uh, to find a play for you. And, I mean, people say that all the time to me. You know, I got something for you. I want you to do something. I want to work with you. But Nell called me and said, um, I have this play. Now, I'm going to send it to you. If you want it, it's yours. If you don't want it, I'm going to send you something else. I'm going to find you something somewhere. But I think you're going to love this. And so I, I, I read it, and uh, she was right. <laughs> she was right. I loved it. But, you know, and I said, and I, so I started researching it. And immediately, you know, this day of the computers, I saw that it had been done a lot. So I immediately said to her, why don't you give the guy who did it before a, a, a shot at it? Because he looks like he's been all over the country and he deserves a shot. And she said, well, I'm going to do it on Broadway. And he did a great job, an extraordinary job in the regional theaters, but we're going to Broadway. The water is a lot deeper, the sharks are a lot bigger, and the teeth are a lot sharper. So I want to take the, what I think is the finest, what she said, she was blowing my head up, you know, one of the finest directors in the American stage, which is you, and would, you know, if you want it, and I looked at her, I said, yeah, I want it, but it's going to be some trouble. And she said, why? I said, because the, the playwright has to watch me mess this play up. <laughs> it's been successful, and she's heard standing ovations or whatever, who's and ahs, and I have to start from page one because I haven't seen it, don't want to see it, I'm not interested in that respect. I'd love to see it after this is over and see what happened there because it was wonderful, I hear. But I want to make it new. So she, Karen here, I said, I have to talk to her. So we had a real sober conversation, yeah. and I said, you've seen this baby fly. Are you, are you really willing to see it just not even be able to roll over? Because <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. I know I love this play. I have a vision, and let me tell you what it is. And I told her, and I said, but do not answer now. Sleep on it a couple days, and let me know, because I'm really going to, it really is going to look a mess for a while. And she called, and we tearfully had an agreement that, okay, I need you to take it. I love Jose, who did it before, and I love my cast before. And she said, well, what about the castle? I don't want nothing. What about the music? I don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. What about the nothing? Stage met nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I got to start new. Yeah. And she agreed. And, I mean, she's very generous like that. And, and we started from scratch. And she sat there and had to button her lips sometimes. Sometimes she that button popped open. Boom! <laughs> That shouldn't be that. <laughs> okay, let me figure it out. <laughs> and so, and what you see tonight is a culmination of our our, our collaboration in, in this vision that I have for this new vision for this play. 
So Nell Nugent, you know, is a woman of a certain age, and uh, she there was a moment in the American theater when she and her partner, Elizabeth McCann, uh, became really shattered a glass ceiling that prevented women producers from succeeding on Broadway. And that period that Ruben's talking about, which I guess was like the 80s mainly, there was a period where every major serious drama on Broadway was produced by McCann and Nugent, these two women. Um, and you know, they, they, uh, the, 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 the scuttlebutt on Broadway, the male producers, the, the male theater owners didn't know what to do with them. These two extraordinarily powerful women who made made stuff happen, but they really kind of changed the game on Broadway. And uh, in that period was when I was a student and th these names like loomed large in my imagination as these two towering producers. So my phone rings and it's Nell Nugent. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, you know, like if the if the 20 year old Barry Edelstein knew that he was going to one day pick up the phone and it was going to be Nell Nugent, he would have said, I refuse to believe that that's ever going to happen. And she said, well, I've got this project I want to talk to you about and it had these two artists involved who are family at the old globe right we had produced yeah. karen's work reuben was here also god knows i've known you reuben for like uh, 25 years something like that we go way way back so it just had a certain sense of kismet about it when the whole thing came together um tell me reuben what really is new and different. You don't know Jose's production. You didn't see it. Um, tell me what you knew you wanted to do, what you thought you would bring to it that was new. I, th I thought the, the, the play was so rich and uh, the language was so melodic. You know, and I like melodic writers. I like Shakespeare, August Wilson. I like Ibsen. I like writers, you know, that have melody. And this play is just chock full of melody. I said, let's put more melody. Let's let's put a hat on this hat. Let's put let's make the most luxurious Latin music and span a wide realm of Latin cultures. I want to reach out to to the to South American countries, Central American countries, Caribbean countries, anybody that has Latin roots, I want them to be represented in this play. So I I found a different kind of composer, a composer who knew these, this wide realm of Latin music, from bachata to salsa, tango, um, bolero. Uh, I wanted to hit. I wanted to hit a lot of chords. And his name? Ricky Gonzalez. And, uh, and how would we know him? I snatched him off the road from Mark Anthony. He was, <laughs> you know, doing, you know, composing some, not composing, arranging Mark Anthony's music. He's been with J Lo, Ray Boreto, uh, you just uh, Tito Puente. He's been with everybody. Uh, Celia Cruz. If you know any of these Latin artists who are the kings and queens of Latin music, yeah. um, and he agreed, um, and now I know he probably wish he hadn't because I'm driving him. <laughs> oh, am I driving him? You know, it'd be like no, there's no moments when you when you're when you're putting a play together yeah. like this. There are no free moments. Yeah, there really aren't. You know, you this becomes your your real family yeah. because you spend more time here. They she left her family. You know, I left my family and everybody in here. I mean, Mandy Gonzalez, who's in the play, has never been away from her daughter for this long. She'll go away to do a concert two days and come come back. And, you know, and so it's a lot of consoling and it's a lot of hugging and it's a lot of, you know, get the kids here, get the family here. And everybody makes a sacrifice because we believe in something. And what we believe in is a play that this wonderful, wonderful writer has presented to us and, and, and trusted us with. So, so... Anyway, I got off to... And, and we have some major people in it, right? Tell us yeah. about, you know, Bianca. Uh, tell us about some of the folks in the cast. Ruben. Bianca Meroquin. Bianca is the... She did Chicago all over, the Broadway musical Chicago, all over Latin American countries, South America, Mexico primarily. And, and she's and the driven. first... And where? on Broadway. And on Broadway. And on Broadway. Broadway. She's, she's yeah. the first Latin person to star in Chicago on Broadway. Did both Roxy and Belma. Did both roles. So I saw her. We were doing a Broadway event, 50,000 people between 40-some Street and 50th Street, and we're doing a Broadway on Broadway, and I was there doing Lackawanna Blues, playing my harmonica with my two blues playing guitar brothers, and we're going to turn these 50,000 people out. And before we came on, Bianca Marroquin was singing with Ana Valenuela, mm -hmm. and they were like, I said, oh, my God, I need both of them in this play. You know, but uh, uh, I got one. I got <laughs> Bianca, and then I was more than blessed. I mean, I, I went to heaven when Mandy Gonzalez said, who's original in In the Heights, that song, Breathe, if you ever heard that or love that song from In the Heights, that's a great soundtrack, by the way. <laughs> a, an extraordinary. 
she agreed, and I, I couldn't get Mandy. I, I, quick, quick story. I wanted her. I said, I can't get her. I called her agent. Oh, she's not available. I called her friends. She's not available. I said, how can I get this woman in this play? And my wife and I were coming from a Broadway play. It's raining. So I go up under an awning to, to, to wait for my Uber, and this statuesque, beautiful woman walks up behind me and says, Ruben Santiago Hudson? I said, yes, ma'am. She says, uh, I'm, I'm Mandy Gonzalez, and I have to work with you. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, destiny. It was destiny. I, I, said, I, said, I said right there, and I said, I, I made a fool of myself. I said, I got to play right now. I'm going to send you. <laughs> and she said to me right then, I promise you, she said, I'm in. I said, no, read it, read it, because I don't want you to change your mind. She said, I'm in. She'd never read it. And, and, I, and I sent it to the agents, and I never got a response. And then I called her personally. I had to find her number. So I called one of her dear friends who was in Jitney. said, Could, would you give her my number? Within 10 minutes, the phone rang. She said, yeah, so when are we doing it? I said, your agent won't return my call. He didn't want her in San Diego when she's doing concerts all over the world, making long money. I mean, money that's long, longer than train smoke. <laughs> but um, so she said, I'm in. Regardless what my agent says, tell me when rehearsal is. And she's here. And she is going, she's breathtaking in this play. Yeah. And then Ruben called me and said, we have Mandy Gonzalez. I'm like, oh, I need to write a new song for her. <laughs> so they went to work. <laughs> yeah, and just to, uh, the two young women, too, yes. I, I think, are, th those, th that's one generation, Mandy and Bianca, but the two young women who are the leads in the show, too. Will you tell us a little bit about them? Jacinia Ayala, who was in the most recent West Side Story playing Anita, and uh, Amelia Suarez, who just graduated from Carnegie Mellon. So it's like, you know, and I'm, every day I'm telling them, what did I teach you at Carnegie Mellon? This is what I'm going to teach you. I'm your <laughs> new teacher now. So they're both extraordinary, and, and they're, they're forces to be reckoned with. Uh, uh, you know, Jacinia has, has experience. You know, she's one of the, one of the premier Broadway dancers. And, uh, and Amelia, we just threw her in the deep end, and she's just just, just wonderful. Yeah. You know, to see this good. new, new, Gonna new generation. Be a gigantic star, really, truly. And Ruben, uh, you know, as you did with Jitney, the, the, your, you know, you have many, many, many strengths as a director, but one of your true superpowers is creating an ensemble, creating a company. Um, I, I don't know if you remember Jitney. I mean, first of all, those guys, they just like lived together, right? I mean, they went to dinner together, they had to breakfast together, they went out for a beer together. I mean, it was like a true family. And the same is, is, is happening here, and it's a function, Ruben, I think, as I watch from the outside, of the way you open your heart to these artists. It's been my experience that actors who become directors have an uncommon bond with actors anyway, but you have an extraordinary way of opening yourselves uh, yourself to this company and offering yourself to them. I, I, can you just talk a little bit about, I mean, is that was that trauma from bad directors that you worked with? Was it just, like, is that how you raise your kids? I mean, you know, what is that? I, I don't raise my kids. My beautiful wife raises the, yeah. I just told her, I'm going to make sure you have everything you need to raise them. But um, no, I'm, I'm a, good, a good dad, I believe. You got to ask them about that. But um, with these, with this group, with actors, I always, I started acting, I mean, directing. I, I directed a long time ago. Quick story, I directed a long time ago. I quit directing because I didn't know how to get an actor in a position to be successful in his role. He kept wanting me to show him. And I said, no, 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 you have to do it, you own it. This went on for days, days and days, and we get close to the show. I said, you have to dig deeper into that role. I need real feelings and real moments and connections. He said, you do it. And I was direct, it was the musical Raisin. And I went on stage and I said, okay, man, I'm tired of this. Let me show you how this goes. And he walked out of the theater and I have never seen him again. So I had to start the show till I found another actor to replace him. And I said, I'll never direct again if I can't find a way of communication to, to help an actor and put that actor in the best possible way to deliver this, this performance. So, so I didn't direct for 20 something years. And then August Wilson told me, you need to be directing my plays. And I came back. And because I always felt, I want to be the kind of director that I always wish I had. And you know, I've had some great directors and I had the other, <laughs> and I had the other stuff because I've done, you know, in in my forty seven years of professional theater, probably mm, three great directors. I've had some good ones, and I had schlock, 
but uh, uh, I wanted to be what I, I wish I had as a director. As one of the great directors. Okay, so over a martini sometime, you're going to tell me the names of those three directors. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Karen, you mentioned epic theater, right? Yes. And And one of the interesting things about this piece is it actually is a telenovela. There's this extraordinary story, and it, 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 it borrows from sort of classic... Shakespeare's in there, you know, children switched and storms and, you know, there's there are many, many, many sort of elements of classic narrative yeah. and, uh, and uh, you know, an unbelievably funny final scene when all the relationships are unraveled that feels like the last scene in a Moliere or a Shakespeare play or something like that. So that's there. But the other figure that's there is Bertolt Brecht, right? And Bertolt Brecht invented this form of theater that we call the epic theater that had this technique of alienation it's translated as from the German, which sort of reminds the audience that they're watching a play at all times, reminds the audience that they're in the theater. And you sprinkle throughout the text these little factoids about American life and about, in particular, uh, Latin life in America, right? So tell me about that technique. Why, why do that? Why, why not just let it be the crazy story and we get to enjoy it? What, what, what's, the, what's the thinking behind mm -hmm. snapping us out of it and making us look at it from a certain point of view? Uh, because there's probably been two Latin American plays written by Latin Americans on Broadway, and if you're going to get the microphone and have an audience, have an opportunity to talk about what's really important to you. And so, yes, the telenovela is a vehicle, and there's a lot of things happening, but there's a social commentary going on at the same time. So, it, yeah, it's wonderful to have a good time, but it's wonderful to have a good time and think. And when you're working with an activist like Ruben, you know, it, we, it, it's part of why we do this work. Why, why do we build a, a, a rehearsal room that listens to everybody and has kindness in the bottom of it? Because that's the kind of world we want to build. And why do we put a play like this and share it with you? Is because behind it, there's something that we want to share and build with you. And it takes the audience and the people on stage to make the world a better place. And so it's an opportunity. If you're going to, you know, if, if I'm going to have a chance to have the stage, I will give you a good meal, but I'll also want to talk to you about some of the things eat that I matter about. Yeah. And eat your vegetables. Yeah. But the vegetables are delivered with some nice sauce, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not, you know. Vegetable, the, the, vegetables are delicious. Yes, vegetables are <laughs> vegetables. Listen, are it's, 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 it's like. We all want the greatest forms of entertainment. We want fine things. This is a fine, fine play. And, 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 the, and, and what you have to be is entertained, but what you need to be is enlightened. And so when you can get both in the same time, you know, it's one thing about trying to teach something or bam something over your head. It's another thing to enlighten you about things. Because what is known about people that look like us is what other people have said. Let me let that ring. <laughs> now, when we get to say who we are, you that's what brings that that's what breeds familiarity, what breeds comfort, what breeds community. When people get to escape all the stereotypes and find out where the heart and soul uh, of other people lie and what's important to them. I mean, I'm a little boy from Lackawanna, New York, raised in a rooming house. Look up the film Lackawanna Blues. It's on. It's on. A YouTube free. Somebody uploaded. I let it stay there. It's in high def on YouTube. <laughs> I'm giving. Let, I'm giving it to you free. My lawyer said take it down. I said no. Leave it. I was raised in a rooming house. The world said I was nothing. On the welfare, my real mother was a heroin addict. A woman took me in and raised me. Said I'm gonna make something out of you. I'm gonna give you a chance in the world. My obligation now is to do her proud. To give back to her in the community what she gave to me. So one of the things I found out in the world that was telling me I was nothing, and they told me I wouldn't matter, that I should be an auto mechanic. And I said, I'd be a good auto mechanic because I'd give it my all. But every step along the way, people pushed me into more higher education, master's degrees, honorary doctorates. And so I, the, the thing is, then I had a chance to tell you who I am. And in that journey, I got to go to, to shivers, and I got to go to bar mitzvahs, and I got to go to Scotland and Ireland and see and hang out in pubs, and I got to go to Africa, and I found out these cultures. I'm like, I'm fascinated by this. When I go see a play, uh, 
uh, uh, McConaughey, what is his name? Uh, 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 the great playwright. Oh, the Irish. McDonough? Yeah, yeah, Madonna play. I yeah. do not understand anything for the first 15 minutes. Hey, bloke, what's that? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. How dare you? How dare you? I am fascinated. I am watching that thing like this. I'm looking at the texture of their suits. I'm looking at the language, their posture. And it's the same way when I go see David Henry Wong's plays. I don't understand it for a while. Who understands Shakespeare for the first 15 minutes? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out who I am, even when I'm reading it or directing it or starring in it. It takes me forever to know what I'm saying and doing. But then that's when the real feelings are revealed. In this play, through a telenovela, real feelings get revealed. And you get to experience things that are important to us about love, laughter, joy, animosity, pathos, pain. You know, it's, it's wonderful to experience other things because then when you look at me, instead of that guy that might, might break into your car or what somebody told you that I was going to harm you or take your purse, then you find out, oh, he's a father of four. He's a doctor. He's a mentor. He's a husband. You dig? So what I want to do is give you the opportunity to breathe me in the way I've always had to breathe everybody else in America in. It's beautifully <laughs> said. Wow. <laughs> Ruben, you are uh, remarkably beautifully said. So, so tell me, wh what are you working on? You've got a couple more preview rehearsals, right? We've mm -hmm. been here. We've been in. We've been here. Oh, six weeks, close to two months now, maybe, working on the show. Uh, the show opens Friday night. You're rehearsing in previews. W what'd you do today for four hours yeah, in tell there? Tell them what I, oh. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. We sang some songs. You know, it's like everything, you know, this is the thing I said to my cast one day. I said, listen, you guys are extraordinary. And I said, what the goal is, perfection is perfection. But if I ever reach perfection, now, he talked about all those awards, Sometimes I get uncomfortable with them because my wife is here and she'll tell you my awards are in boxes. They are boxed. And there are a lot of them. There are, there are several boxes. And I'm not saying that to brag. But that's not why I'm doing this work. I need to do the work to always seek the truth about my people and also to reach this goal, this, this just selfish goal of excellence, which I've never done. <laughs> and if I do it, I'll never get back out of the bed. I just lay there. <laughs> So I told my cast, I said, always reach for excellence, but no, you'll never attain it. But that journey from square one to excellence is what we get up to do. Barry has done it extraordinarily, extraordinarily well here at this school. This is, this is the premier regional theater in the country, yep. in my estimation. And, um, and when I had a choice, we had a choice right. of where to go. We had a couple hits. People were like, more than a couple. We come here, come here, come here. I said, the Old Globe is the place because of the diversity of San Diego and the proximity to Mexico and the, the, the staff, the, the crew, the costume, the, 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 the scene shop, the sound, the people that work here. The props. Are, wow. The props is the best in the country. <laughs> and I'm telling you from long experience, they care. This is their home. We're their guests. So this was the place we wanted to be. And because of you, in all honesty, the, the educated theater goers, and also those, there are people that's coming to this play that never been to theater. Yeah. My Uber driver showed up yesterday. I gave, the four people were looking at the poster outside, and I stepped out to get there. They said, what is this? I said, it's good. You need to be there. <laughs> and we talked for about 15 minutes. I told Barry, yeah. I pulled out my little discount coupon. I said, it's $29 tickets. I said, when we get to Broadway, it's going to be $200. <laughs> so listen, and in a minute, there'll be $79 here take this and come in. And it was one man and three women. And the man was like, well, what time does it end? I said, about 1030. Well, how am I going to get to my car? I said, walk. They're like everybody else. Walk to your car. And then me and him were talking. He said, well, I'm going to fall asleep. And one lady said, I haven't been to a play in so long. And the other lady said, I've never been to a play. The one woman that I gave the coupon went straight to the box office, bought four tickets. And when she walked away, the man said to me, well, I guess I'll get a good nap. And I said to him, sir, if you don't want to be here and don't like it, because you're going to have to be here because you're riding with them, I personally will give you your money back. I don't like my wife to hear me say that because you'd be like, let me give all the money away. But I said, I will give you your money back. I, that's how much I believe in this. That man sat up and they, coincidentally, they were in our row. Yeah. They're in our row and he's got one of these. And all you can hear is, because he's watching the play <laughs> like this. I keep checking in with him. He's like. 
I want because I looked down. I was gonna say, man, stop. You know, I was gonna tell somebody, please, sir, please, whoosh, with the thing. But I couldn't tell him anything because he was. <laughs> oh my God, I couldn't believe it. And I went to look for him after the play, but they had gone. I just had to thank them for coming. Never been to a play. Hadn't been to a play in a long time. And that's what we need. We need you, and we need the people you know, and your grandkids, and your kids. You know. Anyway. I ain't that's a great that's a great story. Um, uh, one last thing before we wrap up. So uh, the Globe about oh, a year and a half ago formalized a relationship with uh, Secut in Tijuana, Centro Cultural Tijuana, which is the big performing arts center there, making us, as far as we can tell, the only regional theater in America that has a formal international relationship with a partner. And we're doing all kinds of stuff with them back and forth. And you know, Mexico, Karen's 20 minutes from here, right? Yeah, you, you leave right now, you'd be in Tijuana in 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, tell me tell me if you think that the theater, and, and, and I should say, also 20 minutes from here, you see fragments of the infamous border wall, you know, right here at the border crossing in Tijuana is where all the political churn around, um, uh, you know, so-called migrants from Central America. It's all happening literally 20 minutes from here. Yeah. Ground zero of a major American political issue having to do with our relationship with South and Central America. Tell me if you think the theater this rarefied and sometimes remote art form. Tell me how you think that can inform our understanding of what's happening 20 minutes from here, if it can. Absolutely. I mean, story, we can get story everywhere. You can get it on your phone, you can get it on your computer, you can get it on the TV. Theater is unique in that you're experiencing a story alive in a room. What theater is not about story, it's about community. And when it really works, it's about communion. And it's a moment of realizing that all the people alive in the room, we all have our journeys. And so what I'm excited about what this play is doing, the intersection of people who are coming to it, the people who are finding themselves in it, the universality of those stories, it just, we have to keep reminding ourselves in these fractured political times that at the end of the day, we are one family, right? And, um, and that is a big message. That's, you will see here that message in the play. But if, if we forget that, then we are doomed. And we just have to keep remembering that. And I do think the theater is uniquely positioned to do that because nobody will experience the play that we experience tonight. Tomorrow will be another play because of the people in the audience and all of that. But we tonight together, we're sharing, we're alive together. And you know, after COVID, where we're all isolated, we don't take as much for granted. So I, I also want to thank all of you for being out here and for lending your time and your hearts and your curiosity to do this because that's the only way we learn and grow. And I'm really excited to learn and grow. And that's why going on this voyage with Ruben and Nell has been so great because it was scary and it was different and I had to learn things and I had to let go of things. But I also got to grow and I hope we get to do that together. They say every play, every good play, has an unanswerable question in it. Because all of us don't, that's, that's what life is about, trying to figure out how to live your best life and be good neighbors. I mean, that was what Native Gardens was, how can you be a good neighbor? And, um, and this is like, how can we be a better family? Beautiful. Well, two major artists in the American theater doing an extraordinary piece of work. Ruben, Karen, thank you both very, very much. Thank all of you for coming. Enjoy the show. Tell your friends. Good night. <laughs>